Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 30 of This Week in FCPA, the Thanksgiving edition. I'm the Compliance Ambassador for the Red Flag Group, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend, Mr. Translations himself, Jay Rosen. In this episode, we take a look at several issues which popped up on the FCPA radar over the past week. We look at <clears throat> Teva Pharmaceutical reserving $520 million for an FCPA violation. We talk about Rio Tinto's increased FCPA woes. We talk about a piece that Mike Schur put on the FCPA blog about compliance professionals moving forward under the Trump administration. We take a look at the 2016 SEC whistleblower report. And then we take a deep dive into the J.P. Morgan Sons and Daughters FCPA enforcement action, which was resolved earlier this week. The episode comes in in about 35 minutes. Uh, as this is our last episode before Thanksgiving, we certainly want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. This is Tom Fox, and thank you for listening to This Week in FCPA. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of This Week in FCPA with my good friend and colleague, Jay Rosen, Mr. Translations himself. Welcome, Jay. Thanks, Tom. How are you this morning? Good. Jay, this is going to be our last podcast before uh, Thanksgiving, so uh, I certainly wanted to wish our bevy of listeners a uh, very happy Thanksgiving and a safe and happy holiday weekend, and I think in honor of that, we should uh, designate this as the Thanksgiving edition. And so let it be. (laughs) And so let it be. Amen, brother. So uh, channeling your inner Pope from uh, New Hampshire there, I really appreciated that. Jay, we had a, um, you know, a really interesting week in the FCPA. So, of course, uh, we're still talking about the potential changes from a new administration, and we pontificated that uh, at length earlier uh, on another podcast, our Everything Compliance podcast, which will go up next week. So we won't really rehash that, uh, but we had a fair number of other uh, pretty good-sized stories, and I wanted to start off with a uh, post from the FCPA blog where it announced that, or at least reported that, Israel's Teva Pharmaceuticals had said in a securities filing earlier this week that it has reserved $520 million for an FCPA settlement. And if if it indeed comes in at that number, it would be number four on the top 10 list of uh, FCPA cases. So a uh, really interesting uh, announcement there uh, from Teva. Also, I would note uh, Teva would be the first Israeli company to uh, appear in the top 10. And if I could uh, book in that with, we had our first uh, Israeli-based prosecution for bribery and corruption under Israel's uh, anti-corruption law, of uh, uh, similar to the FCPA. So uh, I would just say that uh, it once again shows the uh, global spread of anti-corruption enforcement. Yeah, and and I think that's a, uh, an important point to um, highlight, Tom, because uh, in the past, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, a lot of the world was looking to use the FCPA as a vehicle to go after uh, local corruption within their jurisdictions. And now, um, last week, we spoke about the new um, version of the French anti-corruption law. We have UK Bribery Act. We have the Brazilian clean company law. So it's uh, it's nice to see that what uh, initially looked as the U.S. being the policeman or the anti-corruption uh, conscience for the world, that uh, we've worked very hard to develop relationships with um, um, enforcers in other countries. And it's nice to see that this is not only something that we believe in, but our global partners believe in as well. And Jay, that leads me to my uh, the second uh, uh, item I wanted to raise for this week. Uh, Mike Schur wrote a piece in the uh, FCPA blog uh, entitled, Dear President Trump, Compliance Officers Are Still Underdogs. And I said we wouldn't sort of rehash what uh, we talked about uh, potential changes in enforcement under uh, a Trump administration. But I wanted to talk about this because, as you know, uh, you and I speak uh, typically from a business perspective, sometimes from a legal perspective, a compliance perspective. And Mike really talks from the heart, and he really writes from the heart. And that's what I love about him. 
and he listed three reasons that he thought should, compliance should not only continue, but should, more importantly, should continue to grow. So he said, to pick up on your last point, fighting corruption through the FCPA is a unique contribution of America to, to global economic growth and to the common fight of decent communities against criminal networks, which has now really moved internationally. Second, that uh, it compliance is really a dynamic profession, and you've articulated many times, in, both in your role as Mr. Translations and in a more general conversation, that compliance is really a business process. And when you sell a translation service of a translation of a code of conduct, yes, that's meeting a legal requirement, but more importantly, it's allowing a company to do business by communicating its cultural values to a workforce where English may not be their first language. So you're, you're giving power to that communication and you're emphasizing to those people who are reading it in that translated language what not only what's expected of them, but how the company expects to conduct itself. And then third is that, um, and this is really what Mike talks about the best, uh, compliance officers have a mission that includes both ethical and moral parts derived from board-centered, board-created, rather, core values and from personal conscience. And that's really what he, I think, brings to the discussion because he talks about that moral part. And it's not really something that uh, most compliance practitioners, certainly no lawyers talk about that, uh, and most compliance practitioners don't talk about it, but he really writes from the heart. He writes from it from that place, and I think it's a, a welcome addition to our conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one, one of the things that I used to be a little bit skeptical about when I was younger, you know, because I've got the gray hair and you're jet black, but I always uh, whether it's because when you're from there, New Hampshire and you have that New England reticence. Is that what it is? That's what it is. <laughs> so whether it was you know reading case studies at Wharton or being involved in the entertainment business out here, I used to be skeptical of companies that had mission statements, and it always felt to be something that was fabricated and just put out there because it needed to be you know, cor- uh, incorporated into an annual report. And when you read somebody like Mike or somebody like Roy Snell, who are as passionate as they are, uh, I'm no longer a cynic and, uh, you know, I-, I buy into it. And the more that you can really talk about how a business is going to ethically conduct itself, uh, not only will it hopefully inoculate yourself and your company from um, problems, but I think it also even appeals to the millennial workforce because I think this new generation who's out there wants to believe that a company can make money and can do good. So, um, you know, a little tangent for me, but that just kind of popped into my head. No, I think you're absolutely right. And one of the things that I've been reading about and seeing more often is precisely that from millennials. Uh, They want to make a difference, yet they want to do so within the context of a profit-making business or capitalism. And they see no contradiction in that. Whereas certainly when I went to college, and you know perhaps you as well, um, that was deemed to be at least potentially a contradiction to make money and do good at the same time. So um, it's interesting that uh, that you would see it in that light. And uh, you know, I really thank Mike for, for bringing that up and continuing to remind us of it and continuing to talk about it because he's one of the leaders about talking about it from that angle. So kudos, Mike. Okay, we had so, a yeah. very ahead, report from the Securities and Exchange Commission. And uh, most interesting that it would come out this week of all weeks, uh, but it was their uh, annual report to Congress from the Office of the Whistleblower. And I'd just like to throw out uh, some of the key highlights, as noted by Jordan Thomas in an FCPA blog post. Uh, In fiscal year 2016, which is October 1 to September 30, the government's fiscal year, there was over $57 million in um, whistleblower awards. That brings the total to over $111 million to 34 eligible whistleblowers. Six of the 10 highest whistleblower awards were granted in fiscal year 2016. There was an increase in complaints related to corporate disclosures and financials 
of over 17 percent. Uh, whistleblower uh, information on offering fraud was 15 percent, and then manipulation of uh, financial statements was at 11 percent increase. But here's the one that jumped out at me, largely because of we practice in the anti-bribery, anti-corruption space. FCPA allegations experienced a significant increase from 186 distinct or separate whistleblower um, informations to 238, a nearly 30 percent increase increase in the allegation type. So uh, very interesting t- statistics. We explore this at some length on our Everything Compliance podcast uh, in the context of where a Trump administration might take SEC enforcement and the whistleblower office. But this would seem to me to be a, a pretty strong statement that whistleblowers uh, are going to the SEC. The program is working. The antitrust division has had a whistleblower program for over 20 years, and it's generally or almost universally recognized as a great success. And uh, the SEC may uh, argue that it's one one of its biggest successes out of Dodd-Frank has been this whistleblower program and, and uh, really be able to keep it going forward. Your thoughts? Uh, Tom, Tom, is there any way to drill down to that number? And do we know whether or not these whistleblowers initially tried to um, contact people in their company? Do, is there any way to get that kind of uh, granularity on this? Uh, the SEC report does not uh, uh, dive down into that. Okay, because I guess that would be probably the only counter argument from a, a, a Trump administration that they should probably give the company a chance to come up with an internal cure. But based on the fact that it's probably some type of uh, fraudulent or unethical behavior, uh, you know, they're probably having to come to the uh, SEC because they're they're not getting any love at the home office. Well, actually, Jay, what anecdotally uh, I'm told at conferences, uh, even by SEC officials, is that 90% of uh, all whistleblowers to the SEC have attempted to report internally. And what that tells me is people are trying to get their companies to do the right thing. They are not running to the SEC simply to get an award, a cash award, and that um, if companies were paying attention and listening then um, these problems would be hopefully resolved and or at least remediated internal to the company. It would never get to the SEC. But uh, if that, that figure of 95% is correct, that certainly would speak to or answer the um, criticism that companies should have the chance to uh, remediate based upon an internal whistleblower uh, as well. Did you just hear like a little whisper go through your – Airs saying Wells Fargo, if they said if the company was listening, I heard that here in California. <laughs> well, if uh, if uh, if you read the Wall Street Journal yesterday, there was an incredible article on Theranos and mm-hmm. the whistleblower uh, in that case um, was actually the grandson of George Shultz, a cabinet member under Reagan, and uh, his grandfather's on the board of Theranos and uh, what the company did to stifle him and uh, keep him from reporting. Uh, and now he whistleblew to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, uh, we don't know if he's whistleblown to the uh, government yet, uh, but Theranos is under investigation by the SEC, so it's, it's possible. But uh, even his, his allegations as printed by the journal may have led to it. So um, I don't know if it's true that everything loose and flaky rolls to the west side of this country, left side of this country or not, but uh, certainly those two examples are California corporations. Of course, here in Houston, uh, the uh, energy capital of the wor- world, we're all, we're all lily white on that, so uh, I've got no room. Well, you're also the FCPA capital of the world. Haven't you claimed that before? We self-proclaimed FCPA enforcement capital of the world, Houston, Texas. Yes, sir. Do you think... Um um, you know, tourism would pick up if you maybe were able to fit that on your license plate? Well, all I can tell you is yesterday on Facebook, I saw the greatest license plate ever. So, you know, I'm yes. a classic monster movie fan. And mm-hmm. uh, you you probably know The Legend of Dracula. It's allegedly based on a uh, 
Transylvanian uh, noble called Vlad the Impaler. And this fellow had a license plate, and it said Vlad the, and then around the license plate with one of those slip-on protections, it had, it was a Chevy Impala. So it read that Vlad the Impala. Oh, that's awesome. That was the single greatest license tag I've ever seen. Uh, and so uh, it's it's possible to advertise that kind of love, but uh, world's world's greatest FCPA enforcement hub, I'm not sure would fit on uh, even a Texas size license plate. All right. So um, are we, are we going to get into the meat of today's discussion? I think we should. Uh, we've had some uh, appetizers. Let's go to the entree. So what would you say is the entree? I would say we would uh, at least spend about five or ten minutes talking about uh, J.P. Morgan's $264 million FCPA fine for hiring sons and daughters in Asia. Absolutely. So uh, why don't you give us a breakdown of the facts? Sure. It's, um, you know, another one of those well-thought-out plans that um, J.P. Morgan Chase found themselves in a position where they were losing business in Asia, so specifically uh, China and Hong Kong, and uh, they felt that they were at a competitive disadvantage to other investment banks who were uh, offering uh, internships or full-time positions to um, sons and daughters of either uh, folks who are involved with companies that were going to the market looking for capital. And so sometimes these were actually uh, state-owned entities, and sometimes they were actual um, political appointees. And um, not only did they uh, make a, uh, like a, a full run at this from about 2006 to 2013, but they actually memorialized it, called the program internally Sons and Daughters, and actually had spreadsheets that were showing uh, which different uh, you know children were leading to uh, uh, mandates. So uh, you know, so many things are wrong there. Just that it was premeditated, that it was annotated, that it was left around to be found. And um, three separate settlements that have happened. Uh, one of them is a uh, hundred thirty million dollar disgorgement. Uh, and they need to remediate uh, their FCPA. They are required to be under this uh, NPA for three years. A monitor is not required, but the disgorgement is significant. Uh, the second ruling is against J.P. Morgan Asia Pacific. They also reached a, a non-PA with the DOJ, and they're required to pay a $72 million criminal penalty. And the third part of this action, uh, J.P. Morgan entered into a settlement with the Federal Reserve, and they need to pay $61.9 million in penalty, and they need to make changes to its hiring practices. Um, I believe I did misspeak on the first one. Uh, the first one is not an NPA, but it's a declination. Is that right, Tom? Uh, actually, no, it is, it is an NPA from the Department oh, it of Justice. It's, it was so, a cease and desist order from the Securities and Exchange Commission. Okay. So those are kind of like high level, but, um, you know, it's, um, uh, we, we never, uh, it, it never fails to stop. Uh, there was a similar action that was settled. Was it last year between, uh, BNY Mellon and there are, uh, other letters out and there is potentially, uh, further um, action within these uh, type of matters from other global investment banks. Uh, and and it really any company, because we also had a uh, enforcement action vis-a-vis Qualcomm. Qualcomm, which was earlier this year. So this is the third, uh, by far the largest. And here, uh, I guess the, the main difference with the Bank of New York Mellon and Qualcomm, as I see it, Jay, is that this was a systemic program. And it was designed and carried out over a multiple of years. It was designed by a business unit overseas, uh, the China business unit, uh, to hide its true intent from the corporate office. So uh, once again, we see a Chinese business unit engaging in FCPA violative contract, conduct rather, uh, to, to garner business. 
So um, that um, is, is certainly something we've seen before. Really, the question is, uh, you have to really channel your inner, inner Ronnie Reagan here of trust but verify where was the corporate office and where was uh, compliance because I would note that in uh, one of the candidates, when the uh, form was filled out, um, uh, his employment application, excuse me, the business justification for hiring him uh, said that, um, let me see if I can get this right. So a business justification form uh, disclosed that there would be an expected benefit to J.P. Morgan by hiring the applicant, writing, among other things, the hiring of the candidate will place J.P. Morgan in a more favorable position for securing future business from the client. Um, This was later changed to the candidate will be trained by J.P. Morgan for a couple of years and, and go back to the local bank. Uh, thus will bring more business. And then the uh, NPA reads, rather than rejecting the hire, J.P. Morgan Human Resources and Compliance instructed the J.P. Morgan APAC employee to remove the offending language, writing, quote, hiring of can of the candidate should not be for the purposes of securing business, future business of the firm. Please remove. Not that we need to look at this or not that don't hire him. Please remove that from your business justification. Um, That really speaks to how ingrained this program was at Morgan, that you would have compliance and HR saying, not saying, oh, don't hire him. He's not qualified, saying, oh, you've written something down that's illegal. Remove it. So um, that was uh, one thing that struck me. Uh, We had uh, several instances where candidates clearly did not meet the hiring standard of uh, J.P. Morgan. And so I have to share with you, of course, my favorite is on one potential (coughs) candidate, there seems to be a strong business reason for this referral hire. And he is from Wharton, comma. Yay! But not very impressive, poor GPA. So uh, I don't know if that's speaking about the candidate or Wharton. But, uh, you know, when you have not very impressive and poor GPA written on a uh, by a someone who's interviewing, uh, my second favorite was, so we have picked up a new mandate in our office today. All we have to do is get the son a full-time analyst job at J.P. Morgan in New York, period. Mission impossible. Uh, <laughs> Next, we are offered now a sell side on an $800 million transaction, and the quid pro quo is an analyst 1B job for his son. The term quid pro quo is not, it's replete throughout the NPA. It's not replete written by lawyers from the Department of Justice. It's replete written by J.P. Morgan employees in emails. And they tied directly the hiring of the sons, daughters, and sometimes close friends um, of uh, the family to getting business. So we really had a a pretty good example of a something of value was given to obtain a benefit. And um, there's a there was there's been a fair amount of commentary about this uh, case. Prior to yesterday, uh, several different people have looked at it. Um, Matt Stevenson, Andy Spaulding, there was a Pennsylvania Law Review article on it, and there were questions about whether or not the FCPA extended this far, or if I could put it in another way, the reach of the FCPA to get to this type of case. And, uh, you know, this is about as, as clear as it gets, Jay, that when you have or give something of value, um, and you get something in return, that's going to be an FCPA violation. And one critique was that, well, giving a job to a son and daughter or family member, uh, that's not a benefit to the individual uh, government official or employee of state-owned enterprises. And I think that argument is really um, not correct. And this case shows that 
by giving something to somebody else, they were getting a benefit back from uh, a government employee. And that would seem to me directly to uh, be what the FCPA is trying to uh, st- stamp out. So why do people seem to be confused? And a lot of times when we look through the FCPA lens, people want to turn it back here in America and say, well, you know, so-and-so is the head of this company and they want their son or daughter to have a summer internship at an investment bank. So, um, you know, people are making that argument, but to what you just said, there's a spreadsheet tying the uh, hiring of Suzy Q to $800 million of an IPO. So why do people tend to conflate that argument and confuse it? I think they're just confused. Uh, U.S. law is very different than than, uh, U.S. law, uh, state law and federal law is very different. And indeed, U.S. federal law, the Hatch Act, uh, we just saw interpreted by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court in the McDonald, governor of former governor of Virginia prosecution. And there you had to have a almost an exchange by the bag man of cash as the quid pro quo. Well, uh, even if you took that analysis and applied it to the FCPA, which is is not valid because the FCPA s- is stands on different language. It's a different drafted statute. Uh, you've got that quid pro quo here. Uh, clearly, uh, that's about as clear a virtual handshake as you can have uh, saying to get this business, we got to do this. So um, uh, I don't think uh, it, it's it's. I would say it's mixing metaphors, but it's not even that. It's it's trying to create an argument where none exists, and there's really no underlying legal or factual basis uh, to make the argument that U.S. law uh, under the Hatch Act, a hundred-year-old law, should be applied to the FCPA, which is a, a much younger law when you have much more specific language in the FCPA. So um, I, I find that whole argument disingenuous at best. So maybe I need to go back to my put my salesman hat on now and say we got to be talking apples to apples and right here we're talking apples to orange. Right when you when you make that kind of argument that uh, different uh, because a law in the U.S. under the U.S. Constitution is interpreted differently than a different law outside the United States, it's exactly right. I just think it's very interesting that some of our colleagues here are very learned, and for them to be opposing this uh, when to your point. The quid pro quo is very obvious. So, you know, it's um, I I don't know if if this specific reaction here falls under to, you know, people wanting to have their own facts like, you know, what we just witnessed for the last uh, nine to 10 months of Republican facts and Democrat facts. I think there's indisputable facts here that these hires led to business for this company. And it's also interesting, as you initially pointed out, that it's in China again. And people or companies have been looking west. No, is it west or east? East. I guess uh, looking east to grow themselves. And consistently, this jurisdiction has put up uh, issues across many different uh, industries where bribery is in systemic and endemic there. So it, again, is just a cautionary note to any of our listeners out there. If you're doing business in China, if you've got a third party in China, if you're looking at a JV, you really have to look hard and keep this in mind because it goes across the pharmaceutical industry. It goes across investment banking. It goes across telecommunications This is a big red flag, and this is what you need to be aware of when you're doing business in China. And I guess, Jay, the the greater point is that if there's not a business, just a legal business justification for hiring someone, you shouldn't hire them. And when it comes to hiring, the business justification is step one, do they meet our hiring criteria? And if they don't, full stop, you don't hire them. If you do hire them, then do they meet our performance standards? And there were several of the candidates who slept through meetings, couldn't do the work, 
uh, were always late, and it didn't meet a, a, frankly, very high standard that I think J.P. Morgan expects of their employees, which is why they're such a successful company. And so if an employee doesn't meet their minimum uh, employment standards, uh, they are terminated at you know, after counseling or, or writing up and working with them, they should be terminated. And that's what we see here is they didn't meet the minimum standards. And that was really the key for Bank of New York Mellon and Qualcomm. The candidates did not meet the minimum hiring standard. There was no legitimate business reason for hiring them other than to get their parents' business. And uh, I remember when this case first broke in the press, I was at a at the uh, Wall Street Journal conference in, in Washington, and someone put this question to the panelist is, would you hire the son or daughter of a government official? And the answer was, we will always consider doing that if they meet our minimum hiring standards. Uh, they have to go through the regular hiring process. They have to be approved that way. Is it high risk? Yes. But even if uh, the, the parent or a relative can send us business, if we segregate or put a Chinese wall, there may be a way to manage that risk. So the key here is not that uh, they hired the son or daughter, it's that they hired them with no legitimate business reason, or in the employment context, no legitimate HR or employment reason to do so. And that's really the, the, the larger uh, point that needs to be understood that these commentators are not focusing on, which is why, did, why were these people hired if they didn't meet the minimum hiring standard or they couldn't do the rigorous work required at J.P. Morgan? Uh, ready for a pop quiz? Sure. Who's the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase? Jamie Dimon. Who's being considered to become Secretary of the Treasury? Jamie Dimon. Bing, bing, bing. You're right on two accounts. It doesn't sound like a good idea, does it? Well, uh it probably doesn't put me in the category of yet ready for final jeopardy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan is a very large organization. Mr. Diamond's done very well there. They've had some some problems. The London Whale, uh, for instance, I think was a much bigger problem. <clears throat> but um, uh, I really think if we focus on this, it is uh, – if you look at the facts of this case, anyone would read this and go, well, of course this is a violation. There's no no reason or purpose to hire these people other than to get the business. And then you took Tom Fox's mantra to heart and you documented, documented, documented. <laughs> they documented not only the hire, but the person that they were targeting for the business. And then they documented whether or not they got the business. And then they documented the marketing expenses it took to hire the person. So, uh, you know, when you have that kind of spreadsheet, that's something that uh, is not going to be very good for you in the context of an FCPA enforcement action. So let me just push this a little bit harder. The, there's an NPA with J.P. Morgan Chase, the parent company. What expectation should there have been that Mr. Diamond or people in New York should have known about this in the same sense that they definitely knew about the London whale and they are, there was an issue of timing and releasing of that knowledge? Do you think that there's a potential for uh, that same kind of uh, linkage in this issue? Is that you, Dad? I am your father. So yes, uh, no, no. My my uh, the fault or mistake or inadequacy of J.P. Morgan, the parent, was in failing to monitor. Um, did they have a compliance program in place? Absolutely. Could it have been close to best practices? Maybe. But having a program in place is only step one. You have to have oversight, and you have to put a second set of eyes. And if you're born after 1988, I'm sorry. You're going to have to go back and learn to channel your inner Ronnie Reagan. Jay and I were born before 88, so we can channel our inner Ronnie Reagan. Trust but verify. The One of the key components of a best practices compliance program is ongoing monitoring and ongoing auditing. And when you have... 
sons and daughters of Chinese government officials who are sent to New York, the very home office and mothership of J.P. Morgan, and they are determined not to be adequate for the position. And the position is actually funded by J.P. Morgan China because New York won't pay for this dead body to do nothing in their office. That's a red flag that needs to be investigated. So I think there was a, there, I know there was a robust compliance program in place because we both know people that work there. The mistake or an action by J.P. Morgan, the parent, was failure of oversight. Okay, I was just uh, being argumentative just to kind of get the full discussion out there. But uh, thanks for uh, thanks for putting up with my recalcitrance. Well, um, so how about them Cowboys? Eight and one, baby. I'm a believer. You're a believer. And how about, how about Tony Romo doing the right thing or at least publicly doing the right thing? That That's what being a cowboy is all about, Jay, doing the right thing. So, uh, you know, I love Tom Brady. We're both Michigan grads, uh, but let's just leave that point with a period there. But, yeah, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's the biggest, uh, the first time uh, Cowboys have won eight straight uh, since the early 90s. I don't know how long it's going to last, but I'm going to enjoy it. Well, uh, Mrs. Translations is a big Redskins fan, so we are eagerly looking forward to Thanksgiving Day. And uh, if the skins are up to it, they will give it their best shot. Well, uh, I can remember when it was a great rivalry, and uh, it was a great rivalry for a long time. It went into the tank when both teams went into the tank for a long time. So uh, if we can get that rivalry back, it will be uh, great for the NFL, I think. Yeah, and I guess uh, also great for the NFL was the fact that the election happened because viewership is up uh, 20 percent. So. My favorite commissioner, Commissioner Goodell, I guess, is uh, going to get anointed for another uh, long run there because uh, he hadn't significantly damaged the NFL brand as much as certain people think he did. So let me let me put this question to you, Jay. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it the election or is it the fact that we had the two best uh, signature games on Sunday night and Thursday night that uh, we've had this year uh, that uh, viewership is up? Do you, you're not suggesting that there's no correlation between quality of the product and viewership, are you? Being a Hollywood guy. Yeah, I don't know. In Hollywood, quality is not job one, right? <laughs> viewership. Viewership. Yeah, um, I, I think it's it, it is it's you, you make a good point, Tom. That uh, you know, in, in mid season, the players are finally probably where they need to be. So they're playing well. And, I mean, th- both those games were just outstanding. Uh, we're, we're talking about the, uh, the Pittsburgh-Dallas game, and we're also talking about New England-Seattle. And even um, who else was on? I mean, there were, there, the, the Broncos and Saints were crazy, too. Well, I mean, so, last uh, night, even the Saints-Panthers uh, game was good. Um, yep. Although I will have to say I watched the University of Houston actually stomp Louisville into the dirt, thirty-one uh, nothing at halftime. So, uh, but uh, you know when you put a good quality product on your signature Sunday, Monday, or Thursday night games, I think your viewership's going to go up. Yep, I would agree, and um, I guess it just kind of shows us in, in retrospect that the part of this country was engaged in what was happening uh, over the last several months. We just didn't uh, take into account who they were or give them any credit for paying attention. I think that's a great note to end on. Well, Jay, I hope you and your family have a great Thanksgiving. Tom, you too. Are you, uh, you frying the bird or what are you doing? Uh, Actually, we're having the bird in Venice next week. In Venice, Italy? Venice, Italy, not Venice, California. Wow. Is, uh, that, that's going to be uh, a, a nice trip. How long you gone for? Just for the week. Just for the week. And uh, will, the, uh, will the Volkovs be in Italy at that time, or are they still going to be here in Southern I think California? they'll be here, so it'll just be uh, kind of a solo gig from the Foxes. Cool. And is is there like a is there a Harry's bar there or something? So, something to do with Hemingway in in Venice or am I there getting is. confused? There is. It's right on St. Mark's Square. 
and that's where that's the uh, contest you participate. No, you you participate in the New Yorker thing, right? Right. But I think there's also um, uh, a Hemingway essay contest every year for Harry's Bar. Oh well, I haven't participated in that yet, but uh, maybe I'll be inspired by uh, going through it this year. All right. Well, we'll Facebook it, and if you get a chance, um, go to the Doge's Palace because I always uh, I can spend hours in there. That place is pretty cool, right off of uh, St. Mark's. I will do so. All right. So, uh, happy Thanksgiving to you and yours, and uh, we will pick this up uh, post Veniza. Great. Thanks again. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. I have two calls to action for you. First of all, if you're listening to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate us. It would certainly help. And then uh, Jay and I are going to try and do a mailbag episode. So if you've been wanting to put any questions to Jay and I, shoot me an email at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to This Week in FCPA for the week ending November 18th. 2016.